Amen. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? My name is Brandon. Uh, I'm the lead pastor here at Vibrant Church. It is a privilege uh, to be with you. I actually had a, a fun experience this last Friday night where I was talking to a, a girl, and she's like, you're a pastor? How old are you? I'm like, how old do you think I am? She's like, uh, I'm just going to guess 26. I'm like, I have four kids. One of them's 14. So you're close, only off by about a decade. Uh, but I am the lead pastor here at Vibrant. There's no older man about to come out from underneath uh, or behind the curtain. Uh, this is as good as it's going to get. So welcome to Vibrant. I hope you have a great time today. Our approach to church is certainly different. Before I jump into the message, though, I've got a really fun announcement, something that I've been looking for, searching for, asking God to open up some doors for. It is we have a need for a believer's service, a, a service that goes to a little bit deeper into the pool, worships a little bit longer, the teaching's a little bit deeper there's some time set aside just to do ministry to people it, it's going to be so great anyways we're going to have our first one not this thursday but october 7th at 6 30 to 8 o'clock i want to encourage you to come if you're looking for something a little bit deeper into the pool i'm really excited for what i believe that god has uh, at this gathering together uh so if you have new people in your life that are Far from God, Sunday is the right environment to bring them. If you have people in your life that just need a little bit more, Thursdays would be for them. Uh, so we're creating a little bit different environment. But we're going to jump in to today's message. We're in a series called Influencer. And today we're going to look at some of the epic battles that come from the story of Daniel. Daniel is a book in the Bible. Uh, he is a central character, and he is part of what's considered to be the prophetic book meaning the books that had a lot to do about times to come. But as you look into the life of Daniel, he lived in a culture that was not godly, but he lived a godly life. And not only did he live a godly life, but he had tremendous influence in the nation that he lived in that was so different from the culture that he adopted and bought into. And today we're going to talk about two classic stories, two stories from Daniel that have a lot of impact on our lives uh, today, but there's two stories of battles. So how many of you love a story of a great battle? Some of you are like, woo, kind of. Some of you are like, I really like battles. Uh, I love the movie Braveheart, right? I, I love the, like, the moment when William Wallace sees the guys fleeing from the battlefield because they're like, look at the uh, English army we're going to lose. They're all running off. And he goes up to him and he says, don't go. Many years from now, when you're dying in your beds, would you trade from this day to that for one chance, just one chance to defy the English and tell them they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom, right? Epic moment from Gladiator. Uh, another one. Any Gladiator fans? All right, glad. Okay, that one got a little bit more. My name is Maximus Meridius, commander of the Northern Army. Father to a murdered son and husband to a murdered wife. And in this life or the next, I will have my revenge. Epic battles. Some of you are like, I don't really like those kind of movies. Let's go Pride and Prejudice. Wickham and Mr. Darcy fighting for Elizabeth. Right? Epic battles. Well, I had an epic battle yesterday. I got to coach my son's 14-year-old flag football opening game of the season. We won 38 to 0. Come on, somebody. Uh, my son passed for two touchdowns, ran for a touchdown, and caught a touchdown. So great job, Levi. I'm proud of you. But it was an epic battle. It wasn't actually that epic. The team was really struggling. We actually caught more of their passes than they caught of their own passes. Uh, <laughs> but today I want to talk to you about the battle of the ages, the, a battle that's existed before all of us were born, and a battle that will exist after all of us have passed on or unless Jesus comes back. But it's the battle that... In the book of Daniel, about one-third of the Bible has to do with future events. And, and this story has to do with something that existed before the story. Uh, we're going to look into these two stories. So Daniel lived at the time of Babylon. So he served underneath four different kings. One king would rule. They'd get conquered by a neighboring nation. They would take over. But because Daniel was Daniel, they kept bringing Daniel into the inner circle of the king. Daniel lives for about 90 years. But the story of Daniel and his three friends, which is the centerpiece of the book of Daniel, is a story of challenged faith. It's a story of, of men of God 
who in a culture growing more and more apart from godliness, chose to walk in God's ways. I think not that undifferent from our culture today. In a culture that's going more and more, and we're going to do what we think, and we're going to abandon the ways of God, we're just going to go our own direction, and our way of thinking is better than God's way of thinking. It might even be called old-fashioned. So today I'm going to share two stories that are seven years apart in time. The first story is this. King Nebuchadnezzar, which is the first king, we talked about King Nebuchadnezzar last week, he made an image of gold 90 feet high and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the providence of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the other um, provincial officers to come to the dedication of the image that he had set up. So the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the other provincial officers assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, this is what you are commanded, remember that phrase, commanded to do, O people, nations and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound, of the horn, the flute, the zither. I don't know if you play the zither. If you do, the worship team could use your skills. Uh, Or the lyre, or the harp, or the pipes, and all the kinds of music. You must fall down and worship the image of gold that the king Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Now, these men knew of the Ten Commandments. They knew that at the very beginning of those commandments was, you should worship God and no other God. So there is a competition, a conflict taking place. All right, so it's either worship the God of Israel or worship this statue created by Nebuchadnezzar. But notice the motive. The motive is fear. You see, the battle of the ages is between God and Satan. And the motive of Satan is fear. He knows there's nothing in him that's lovable, so he wants to get you to bend the knee out of fear. God's motive is completely different. Couldn't be more different. God wants you to worship him not out of fear, but out of love, out of deep, close relationship with him, that you would worship him and worship him alone. But these young men are being forced to choose, to worship, Some of you are like, what does this have anything to do to me? We don't have statues of things to bow down and worship. I believe we do. If you were to do what Jesus told us to do, his command, and that you would go and say that Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the source of truth. There is no truth apart from him. And he is the definer of life, and in him is life. He's the one that defines when it begins and when it ends. If you go and share what Jesus clearly said, he said, I'm the only way to God. There's no truth apart from me. I am truth. When you look in the definition of the real dictionary of truth, you're going to see my picture in it. I I am the life. In fact, in Canada already, there are some scriptures right here in North America where if you read them in church, it's considered to be a hate crime. And there are some states in our nation right now that want to do the same. But here's the enemy's attack on the American church. He wants your faith to be private. No conflict with this, private. But Jesus gave us the great commission, not the great suggestion. He said, go into all the world and share the message of who you were before me, how I've Come into your life and when that happened and and how your life has changed since knowing me. The freedom you found, the love that you found, the hope that you found, the goodness you found. You go and share the message of Jesus and there will be conflict. That's the first story. Here's the second story. King Nebuchadnezzar gets conquered by King Darius. Nebuchadnezzar was not too fond of Daniel, though he trusted him. Darius not only liked Daniel, he respected Daniel. To the point where he makes him basically his right-hand man. 
There was no ambition in Daniel to take the throne while so many of the other officials were trying to take the throne from Darius. So he listened and believed and trusted Daniel. He saw the character of Daniel. He saw the integrity of Daniel, and it was appealing to him. There was influence. So these men that now hate Daniel because of his influence with King Darius tried to create a plan for removing Daniel. Because finally these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless he has, unless he has something to do with the law of his God. If we can create a conflict between the law of the land and the law of his God, we know he's going to choose the, the law of his God first. And because he's going to choose that, this could be our moment. So the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, O oh, King Darius, live forever. Some of you are seeing veggie tales in your mind. How many of you are seeing veggie tales right now? How many of you don't know, have no idea what I'm talking about? That's fine. The, those of us that like grew up in, in, in church as, as little kids, there were these uh, vegetables that discipled us and showed us. And anyways, w- governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce a decree that anyone who prays to any god or any man during the next 30 days, except to you, O King Darius, shall be thrown into a lion's den. Now, O king, issue the decree and put it into writing so that it cannot be altered. See, in this culture, the culture of the Persians, the law had supreme authority. The law had authority over the king. But the king had the right to create law. So if the king created a law that was above him, he would be forced to enforce the law that he had created. In accordance with the laws of the the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree into writing. The first story is you must worship this. The second story is you must not worship that. And that is the story of the world that we're living in today. You're like, but, but Brandon, we don't have idols in our lives, right? Let me, let me define what an idol is. An idol is anything that you like, love, or trust more than you like, love, or trust God. Anything that you lean into more, believe into more, hope into more, let fill your mind in more, that's the idol. You see, the the battle of the ages is this. It's a battle over worship. You you see, in the scriptures it says, in in the last days, the grand battle, the epic scene of Revelation is a battle about worship. You're like, why is worship so important? Here's why. Uh, Satan was created as an angel. He was considered to be a cherub. And what we find out in the book of Isaiah and Ezekiel is he was the angel over worship. His job was to conduct worship in heaven. It even says that his physical form was that of an instrument. But he didn't want to lead worship to God forever in heaven. He wanted to be worshipped. So Satan gets sent to earth. And here's where the misconception often lies, even among believers. We think that there's God and an equal force of Satan battling together at the same time but that's not what scripture says in fact jesus said it like this he said what are you talking about i saw satan fall like lightning like as soon as the battle began it was like oh you're gone because uh, many scholars believe somewhere between genesis 1 1 which is in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and genesis 1 2 which is uh, then there, the earth was form and voidless form and without um uh, th- there was no separation between the land and the water, and the Spirit of God hovered over it. Somewhere between creating heavens and earth and the second day of creation, Satan falls. Leaving a void in heaven, a real void in heaven, for who is going to be responsible now to lead worship in heaven? This is where you come in. The role of leading worship in heaven was now going to be given to men. The reason Satan hates it, the reason that there is a battle over our world that has existed for all of our known time is because you took the role that he was always supposed to carry. That your body too was created as a instrument. Crushing. 
strings as you see me. Because I like you, I won't sing to you today. But in Revelation, it talks about what, how does this all end in this battle over worship. And it talks about this person known as the Antichrist. And Jesus even refers to an Antichrist, someone who's coming against Christ, being true to us, that has a different way, a different method, a different way of going through life. And in 1 Thessalonians, it says it like this, which is a chapter in the New Testament, story after Jesus. It says, don't let anyone deceive you. Okay, so it, how many of you know that there's people in the world that are deceived? How many of you are deceived? Because if I were to have the whole world in this room and say, how many of you are deceived? No one would raise their hand. Why? The problem with deception is it's deceiving. Some of you are like, wow, you're so intelligent. Now I just put the cookies on the bottom shelf so everybody can reach one. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness, this referring to the Antichrist, is revealed. And I love how it, how it goes here. Ah, the man doomed for destruction. Hey, he knows how this all ends. He knows his, the end of his story is it's over. Just like Satan felt like not lightning, there's going to be a come a moment when Jesus is like, all right, enough's enough, this is over, and it will just be over. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Here's, here's the plan of the enemy, to put something in your life that's just above God. He doesn't care what it is. Anything in your life that you would like, love, or trust more than you like, love, or trust God. He wants to end your worship of God. So what can we learn from this spirit of the Antichrist? And some of you are like, I am new to church. Like, spirit of the Antichrist. This seems like, lean in just a little bit. I, I promise. I'm going to make it all make sense. The, the spirit of the Antichrist has two agendas. The first one is this. To exalt man above God. That you would worship anything above God. God. Because if you're God, you get to call the shots. If you're God, you get to set the standard. If you're God, you get to establish what the truth is. And if the enemy can make you believe that you should be like God, that you should be able to call your own shots, set your own standards, define your own truth, or even interpret your own version of truth, which by the way is called polytheism, meaning there can be many gods or there can be many paths to God, which is the opposite of what Jesus taught. He said, I am the only way to God. No one comes to God except by me. You have polytheism. The second one is hedonism. Hedonism was the most common ism in Jesus' time, and it is today the most common ism. Hedonism is that you would establish truth based on your feelings. That, that if it feels good or it makes sense to you, that you should just go along that road. Hedonism. Don't judge me. I'll do what I don't want to. I'm not hurting anybody. Who is God to say that my attraction is not okay? Who is God to determine how I should spend my life and my days? Who is God to tell me what is right and what is wrong? I'm not going to trust God and the word of God. I'm not going to build my life on the message of scripture. I'm going to trust my feelings, my understanding, my ideas. I'm going to build my platform and I'm going to build my life on my opinions. As long as it makes sense to me or it seems good to me, I'll do it. The problem with that is Scripture. In, in the King James Version, I love how it says, it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things. Nothing was created apart from you. You created the heavens and the earth and everything that fills them. And for thy pleasure, they are and were created but we live in a culture that wants a God that's created for my pleasure. It's about my agenda. It's about my plan. That he wants to build my life. Now, I'm not going to do what we sang in that last song. I'll build my life upon your love. No, it's, God, I want you to build. Uh, I want you to be about my purposes based on my interpretation of what I think love should be. But the Lord is God, and he's God all by himself, and he doesn't need my help. I question whether or not to do this. This next piece of it, I'm, I'm going to go there. Uh, the last few weeks, 
um, I've had multiple conversations about people that have, have called Vibrant a, a seeker-friendly church, which I consider to be a tremendous compliment, right? Uh, Jesus was called a friend of sinners. He was, called, he was accused of being a drunkard or a glutton because he spent so much time with people that were so far from God, and he inserted himself in environments where it was like, are you sure God's here? But when you look at the life of Jesus, here's what Jesus did. Jesus intentionally positioned himself and chose a method to reach people that were far, that were far from him. But he gave them grace, which points you to freedom, and he gave you truth, which gives you freedom. So as a church, our method of how we do church is how can we best reach the people in our city and connect with them, people that are seeking God with time to spend. And what are we going to do? We're going to give them grace. Let's go back to the second story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. I'm not going to bow. But even if he doesn't, even if we die in that furnace, we want you to know, O king, that we will never serve your gods or worship the image of gold. We will not bow. You see, what our culture wants you to bend the knee to, to worship, it's their idea. The place where the conflict's going to happen in your life, it's already happening. Because the ideas of our culture are being written into law that go against the very words of God. And which idea will you bow to? They made the statement, I'm not going to trust in my feelings. Because let's be honest, their feelings were we want to live, right? No, we don't want to go into the blazing furnace and burn to death, right? It wasn't their feelings. They didn't trust in their own understanding. Well, God, God could rescue us. He's done it before, but we're slaves to, per, to Persia because of our sin. But, but, but even if he doesn't rescue us and we die in that furnace, I won't bow. See, the first attack of the Antichrist, what Satan wants to do in your life, is to get you to exalt man above God. The second one is this. To stop the worship of God. In the Middle East right now, people are being killed in worse things. And yes, there are things that are worse than that. But even having a Bible app on their phone. In China, if you share the message of Jesus with people at home or in the workplace, you're arrested. In America, it's bow to the ideas. We live in a culture today that will insert characters in the shows that we all watch to make it so you like the character to give a permission slip to an idea that's different from the word of God. So let's just go there with this. God loves people. God wants you to like the character, not just what they do. And, and here's what I think is best about God, one of the best things about following Jesus, is you get to separate people from their behavior. You see them as a person. And as a person, you can love them and love them with the love of God and separate the behavior that can be destructive in their life. Because here's how idol worship happens in, in our world today. It's, it's, it's on your phone. I, I went to the, to the Hot 100 songs this week. So if you saw me in Panera this week and you saw me looking at um, some of the, the latest lyrics, like, what is he doing? I was doing that. I was checking out what, what are the, the popular songs? What are the Hot 100? You know what they were all about? Worship sex. Worship money. Worship your feelings. Worship romance. Worship your kids. Build your life on sex and more of it. Build your life on money and more of it. Build your life on your feelings. Build your life on romance. Build your life on your kids. Music's powerful. In the same way that people come to our uh, worship music and they're like, wow, it's just something like, it's, I don't know why, but I was just, it, it, it's, the, the biblical term is anointing. There, there's, there's 
an anointing on that song. The, on that Hot 100, there's anointing on that song too. It's just not God. There's another spirit, but it's not God. And if you let that into you long enough, eventually your heart will be made to bow to that. You'll exalt men above God. You'll like love and trust me more than you like love or trust God. Let's go back to the second one. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and he prayed. And I love this part. It stood out to me yesterday as I was getting ready. Give thanks to God. His life's on the line for praying. And the first thing that he's doing in prayer, when his life's on the line for doing this thing, is giving thanks. That's what he's doing. What a worldview. Just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying, asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Notice it's not, oh, King Darius, live for get forever anymore. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any other god or man except for to you, O oh king, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Daniel gets thrown into a lion's den. The next morning, King Darius wakes up. He runs to the lion's den, hoping that maybe Daniel's God saved him. And there he finds Daniel alive and well. It says that God shut the mouth of the lion. He orders Daniel out of the lion's den, and the very men that did this whole setup, because now Darius' eyes have been opened. You set me up. He throws those men in the lion's den at which they lion him. The battle of the ages is the battle for your worship, for your worship. Will you have the courage to believe go back to Rad Shack and Benny for all my veggie tales people. <laughs> then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude toward them had changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are, are thrown into this fire, and the very soldiers that tied them up die on their way to throw them in the fire. They, not only did they not die, but as they looked into the fire to see the three men, they actually saw four men. And the king, king Nebuchadnezzar looks in the furnace and is like, wait, what? Who's the fourth man in the fire? And there will be another day when, when I preach a message on miracles, and I'm going to talk about God getting into the heat with you, and, but that's not for today. God did rescue them, but not everyone is rescued from the rage of Babylon. The 12 disciples of Jesus, including Paul, who arguably became the replacement for Peter, all 12 of them died preaching the gospel. Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, is the first recorded martyr where he is stoned to death for preaching the gospel. Polycarp, who's a, in the first century, he's mentioned by John, who wrote the book of Revelation, um, he was burned alive. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, who in the 1940s, in the midst of um, World War II, for preaching Jesus, he was finally arrested and was going to be hung. And right before he was hung, he said, this is the end, but for me, it's the beginning of life. So the question is, what do you worship? Jesus had this incredible ability of making really big ideas really simple. And here's what Jesus does. He says, love the Lord. Notice the, the motive. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Heart and soul. And then your strength. He's saying, hey, I want you to love God not just with your heart. 
this little box that you make, and you, you do it on Sundays for, for an hour when you go to church. But no, 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 I want to, it's like uh, loving God is your whole life. See, ha- heart and soul is your affection. The question is, what do I love most? Well, what do you give your affection to? One of the, the attacks of the enemy against the church has been he's been trying to tame worship over time. When you read the book of Psalms, it was clap and shout and praise and lift high the name of God. Celebrate the goodness of God. But over centuries of the church, it's been no worship is to be reverent and to be somber. That's nowhere in Scripture. It's not that you wouldn't love other things. He just doesn't want you to love them more than you love him. He wants you to love your spouse, just not more than him. He wants you to love your kids. But he wants you to love him more. My son and I are going to watch the dolphins today, and we're going to cheer. But my celebration will not be bigger at 1 o'clock than it was at 1030 at night. What do you love most? What what holds your affection? The second one is your mind. It's your thinking. What do you you think about the most? Whatever is pure and lovely, honorable and good and worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on such things. When I get the scripture every morning, here's what I do. I just try to find one thing. Just, Just one thing that pops, particularly a promise. Uh, for, for this last week, it's just been that one part. It was like, oh, for your pleasure. And that one thing, and just let your mind sit there. Daniel, in the midst of his life on the line, the first thing he knew to do was to thank God. Why? Because when you live in gratitude, your perspective changes. When you see the goodness of God all around you, when you remember that there's more to this life than this life, that like Diedrich Bonhoeffer, this may be the end, but it's the beginning. It's the beginning of something so much better. I'm going to let my mind focused on the things of God, the goodness of God, the favor of God, the glory of God, the power of God, and praise is going to be on my lips because what fills my mind and what fills my heart is God. Last one is strength. What do I give my best to? What do you serve most? I love our our dream team. Our our dream team, there's a portion of them that get here at 6.30 in the morning. They set up the platforms. They set up the kids' room. They set up the ridiculously heavy lights that are in the back. They bring their best. Work doesn't get their best. God does. We get to do this because of the incredible generosity of so many of you. So many of you that you, you give your best. You give your best. You're first. Why? Because your life doesn't belong to you anymore. It's his. It's for his pleasure. May his kingdom come, not mine. The greatest freedom in your life is the moment. When you say, not my kingdom come, but God, may your kingdom come in my life. People that share Jesus, not religion, share Jesus. The hope that you have that you, like anybody on this earth, had a tremendous struggle and you didn't get it right. And at some point when you weren't looking for God, God showed up and he forgave you when you didn't deserve it. He loved you when you weren't lovable. But he forgave you. And he made you new. And he set you free. And he set your heart on something else. And you have now experiencing the freedom of God. Get to share that message with other people question is, what do you worship? But I want to I create a little bit of a space here in the moment as we sing this last song. I want you to ask God, what, what do I worship? What do I love most? What do I think about the most? What do I give my best to? Jesus made, meets a woman at a well. A woman who had a terrible reputation. And they get in an argument over the battle of worship. I love, I love how Jesus responded to her. He says, two questions. Yeah, I'm just going to go with this. I'm just going to stay there. Two 
you a question. Who will you not worship? I won't bow to fear. I'm not going to bow to the fear of the culture that says, you can't worship that. You can't believe that. I'm not going to bow down to polytheism. I'm not going to give my life. to. There's probably lots of different ways. It's fine. Do your thing. I'm not going to bow down to the lies of hedonism that I can trust my feelings and my own understanding. I trust in God. Be not of my understanding. In all my ways acknowledge him and he'll direct my path. I'm, I'm not going to give my life to another. I'm not, I'm not going to bow to anything else. Not even me. <laughs> this, is, this is so cool. I love this verse. It says, For the eyes of the Lord reigns through the earth to strengthen. He, he's looking for people to give strength to. And he says, hey, I'm going to let you know ahead of time. The people that I'm looking to strengthen are those who are fully committed to him. So the first question is, who will you not worship? The second question is, who will you worship? For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Jesus meets this woman at this well. And, and in this conversation about worship, he says, yet a time is coming and now has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God's looking for something. He's looking to strengthen somebody. The one that says, for your glory, for your, your power, for your honor, for your pleasure. Worthy are you, Jesus. Holy is your name. So, Father, right now I pray, God, that you would show us who we worship, what we worship. And God, right now, I pray that you would lead us to a place of repentance in your kindness. God, as we've worshiped other things, you're not angry at us. But God, you're giving us an opportunity to no longer bow to the lie of the culture, but to set our hearts as, aside and apart for you. And God, I pray that you would teach us to worship. Would you show us what it means to love you with all of our hearts? Would you show us what it means to love you with all of our minds? Would you, would you teach us what it means to love you with our strength and to give you our best? And God, would you strengthen us and give us courage to obey you at your word, believing you at your word, even when it doesn't make sense? God, would you strengthen your people today? In Jesus' name.